My beloved brothers and sisters of the Ten Stakes on the Brigham Young University campus, the song that was just sung by the choir so beautifully is my favorite. And I feel tonight that I need the every hour, most gracious Lord. This is a most inspiring group of people. And I would say to you, as you know already, that the eyes of the world are upon you, the students at Brigham Young University. As I come to talk to you tonight, I did not come to entertain you. There are others to do that. But to discuss with you some of the deeper things of the gospel program. Most of you are biologically and intellectually maturing and should be ready to think deeply and order your lives accordingly. I believe in the old adage that an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. And since perhaps the majority of you have not yet entered into the marriage state, I, wa I wish to talk to you tonight about marriage. While some of our young people marry early, yet there seems to be a tendency toward delaying marriage. There seems to be a gradual move toward ignoring and even rejecting this vital and basic program. The Lord said, For behold, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. And in Hebrews we read, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. We're finding that many young people are obsessed with the idea of more and more education, even to the postponing of their marriages. Only yesterday I met a returned missionary, 35 years old, who didn't seem to be very much concerned about the things we talk about tonight, about his marriage. When the Lord organized his world and established its policy, he could have filled the earth with physical bodies in some other way than that which he designed, perhaps some kind of an incubator process. But it seems that merely filling the earth with humans was not the great objective of our Lord. In order to do this, it was necessary that every child that was born into this world should have two parents, a father and a mother to teach them, to train them, to love them, and that that child should be made aware of what was expected of him. As he has done throughout the ages, the Lord reiterated his requirement of those adults who would sire and bear children. The oft-quoted scripture given in 1831 has been basic instruction from the beginning of time and will continue to the end of time, for God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He commands, and again, inasmuch as parents have children in Zion, and that teach them not to understand the doctrines when eight years of age, the sin be upon the heads of the parents. This command was to be a law unto the inhabitants of Zion, not a mere hope or suggestion. The Lord continues, and they shall also teach their children to pray and walk uprightly before the Lord. Remember that this does not cover prayer only, but all the doctrines of the church and the way of life. And the Lord clinches his command by indicating his displeasure that many of the parents were not training their children, and that they were growing up in wickedness, that they were not seeking the riches of eternity. The command to teach the children seems to be of equal power with the command to sire and bear children. It's a sin to fail to teach the children. Most of you are unmarried, but we hope that every normal one of you will be married. And we're reminding you now, with all the force we have, so that none of you will fail a proper marriage, and that you will so completely fortify that institution that it will be an eternal one. We're greatly concerned about the number of our people who are being married out of the temple. 
and even out of the church. Then we're gravely concerned again about that unbelievable number who permit their marriages to go stale and let them be destroyed. May I say here that almost all marriages, almost all marriages could be beautiful, harmonious, and happy and eternal ones if the two people primarily involved would determine that it should be, that it must be. A recent spot check of stakes reveals that less than 40% of the marriages in those stakes were temple marriages. The figures increased in these stakes only two and nine-tenths percent in four years, or less than one percent a year. We recognize that there are a substantial number of ceilings after marriage, but we're mindful also that there are many of the original marriages that fail and are divorced. We wonder why, why near 60% of our people would be satisfied with less than an eternal marriage, and that one of the more prominent reason, reasons for non-temple marriages is the marriage to non-members. This figure is frightening. The same stakes had more than 25% of the marriages were those with non-members. Again, this terrifies us. If 40% of the members married for eternity and 25% married non-members, this leaves another 35% who married in the church but with seeming little interest in the eternal nature of their marriage. May I inject here that selfishness is the element that breaks and corrodes and destroys marriages as it destroys lives and all that is good. The time to make good marriages for the turn of this century is now, in the 1970s. Now is the time to organize your program, to set your standards, to solidify your determination and to prepare for that married period of your lives which will be hard, demanding, and difficult, but which will be rewarding and beautiful and eternal in its nature. The Lord has ordained that these mature spirits which he has created shall be permitted to come to this earth at a proper time, be provided with a small, pure body and a mind uncluttered be given a loving home with two parents to teach and train it, and come to maturity through numerous varied growth experiences, then in turn to marry, provide bodies for another generation, and go through the same process, working toward their eternal, this eternal plan. You have been a child. You are now an adult, and about ready to enter this next phase, which is married life. Some of you are now married, some of you are anticipating, and still others of you are quietly hopeful. <laughs> Next, you will find your eternal companion, and you will marry, and you will beget and bear children. And then begins the long, difficult, but loving process of training them toward godhood. As I visit with missionaries, I remind them of their many specific goals. One is to get their marriage, their family, their education, their occupation, their training. They can, by, prior, by careful planning, have all the blessings they want if they take first things first. For instance, if they marry first, their chance for a mission is greatly limited, if not locked out. If they get their schooling first, their chance for a mission is limited. Taken on a basis of priorities, practically every normal young man can have a wonderful mission, a good marriage, a satisfactory educational training, each in its turn, having all. The training we get in the universities while excellent is limited, it is but a very tiny percentage of the total knowledge. We encourage knowledge in its proper use, but we know there will be a thousand years to study about things. And as compared to the years spent in universities, 
this great learning period is relatively limitless. When we're ready to create our own worlds, we will have great knowledge. Since knowledge is power, we will have power. Since knowledge can make us creative, we can be creators. Since knowledge can yield toward judgment and wisdom, we can be just and worthy and wise. But we cannot wait for marriage until we have accumulated the knowledge we finally will need and want to have in order to create. We need the power of the priesthood to affect the creation and it will have to be there. And you hold the priesthood and can use it as you accumulate the secular knowledge. The book of John says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and this Word is capitalized in my paper. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him the Word, Jesus Christ, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and uh, the life was the light of men. Again in, the fir in 1 John, he says, These things we write unto you, that your joy may be full. For following this program that the Lord has set up for us is the only way to have full joy. And again, we find the early apostles knew more of the program than they have been given credit for. Paul told the Hebrews, God hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being, much, being made so much better than the angels. When we shall have learned all about medicine, mineralogy, zoology, forestry, biology, and all the other ologies, and all about the heavens, and the earth, and all in all of its moods, then, if we also know theology and know it well and abide by its precepts, perhaps then we can exercise our accumulated power to create an earth for our exalted family. But of course, marriage cannot wait for that. We shall marry, have our families, teach and train them while we are learning these other things and building toward our Creatorship. Marriage should come when we're reasonably young, to procreate and bear children, to have the patience to teach and train, and to grow up with them. Hence, marriage is a must, an early must. Of course, we would, we would decry child marriages, but when young people are in their upper years of collegiate work, surely it is time to plan this important life's work. Missionaries should begin to think marriage when they return from their missions, to begin to get acquainted with many young women so that they will have a better basis for selection of a life's companion. And when the time comes, they should marry in the Holy Temple and have their families and complete their education, establish themselves in a profitable and rewarding occupation and give themselves to the gospel and the church and to their families. Brothers and sisters, this is not uh, a matter of guess. It isn't anything to laugh about. This is the most serious thing in all the world that lies ahead of you unmarried young people. The San Francisco Chronicle and Examiner had an article in last year entitled, The Anti-Marriage Revolution. The article came from a young woman, not a member, who wrote to me, I wish it were possible for all these misguided, unfortunate young people to become receptive to your message. I am investigating the Mormon Church, and one of the most favorable aspects of the wonderful teachings is the concern and rapport for, the, for and with the young people. 
That keeps me diligently studying to become worthy for membership in the Mormon Church. In magazines, we see articles frequently on this anti-marriage revolution. We don't hear about it so much in our little communities here. Let me say again, marriage is honorable. It's a plan of God. It is not a whim, a choice, a preference only. It's a must. When we perform the sacred ceremonies in the temple, we frequently tell the young couple this very ceremony was probably given to Adam and Eve in the beginning. The first commandment recorded seems to have been multiply and replenish. When God had created the woman, he brought her unto the man and gave her to him as his wife and added, therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. There is enough in that one line to make a hundred sermons. Think it through very carefully every word. This was not the evolution of Adam to human status. Adam was already an intelligent, trained, and knowledgeable man. He was a prophet in these, his first recorded days on earth. And this prophet blessed God and prophesied concerning his posterity and saw the future and proclaimed, quote, in this life I shall have joy, and again in the flesh I shall see God. And Eve heard all these things and was glad. Adam and Eve made all things known unto their sons and daughters. It wasn't just Cain and Abel. They ceased not to call upon God. And in true order, Adam knew Eve his wife. He knew her, and she conceived and bore Adam's children, many children. And a book of remembrance was kept, and recordings were made in the language of Adam. And angels came from God to teach them by the spirit of revelation. Their children, 33 sons and 23 daughters, according to Josephus, were taught to read and write in a language which was pure and undefiled. Adam and his righteous sons were uh, baptized, received the Holy Ghost, and received the priesthood. And they kept their genealogical records of their first expanding families. This would indicate then that Adam was a great man when we first were introduced to him. He didn't come from the jungle. Young people should not wait to marry until they've finished their schooling. I know that I will receive some criticism on that, but I still believe it true. When they marry, they should not wait for children. I will receive criticism from, on that score also, I am sure, but I still believe it is true. They should not wait for their children until they've satisfied their schooling requirements. On every campus I know, there are married students' uh, buildings for, uh, for their living. Marriage is basically for the family. That is why we marry, not for the satisfaction of the sex as the world around us would have us believe. When people have found their companions, there should be no long delay. Young wives should be occupied in bearing and rearing their children. I know of no scriptures where authorization is given to young wives to withhold their families and to go to work to put their husbands through school. There are thousands of husbands that have worked their own way through school and have reared families at the same time. Though more difficult, young people can make their way through their educational programs. It's a good experience to learn to save and to scratch and to economize. There seems to be a growing feeling that marriage is for legal sex, for sex sake. Billy Graham gave us this statement, which I like. One thing the Bible does not teach is that sex is itself a sin. 
Far from being prudish, the Bible celebrates sex and its proper use, presenting it as God-created, God-ordained, God-blessed. It makes plain that God himself implanted the physical magnetism between the sexes for two reasons, for the propagation of the human race and for the expression of that kind of love between man and wife that makes for true oneness. And that can be contemplated long and wide. His command to the first man and woman to be one flesh was as important as his command to be fruitful and multiply. multiply. The Bible makes plain that evil, when related to sex, means not the use of something inherently corrupt, but the misuse of something that is pure and good. It teaches that sex can be a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. It can be a creative force more powerful than any other in fostering of love, companionship, happiness, or can be the most destructive of all life's forces. Albert Einstein admitted that he had only two ideas. This is about all you need, is two ideas. And since your glory will be your eternal life, then that is idea number one, the desire to become an eternalized and ex exalted being. Basic then to this number one idea is number two, the proper and lasting and loving marriage. Great promises are made to every couple. If they carry forward their marriage in selflessness and rear their children with care and love, that they will have rejoicing in their posterity throughout their lives and forever. Their cups will run over. As we approach this vital subject, we're reminded of the scripture where the Lord says, Strive to enter into the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter it and shall not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and hath shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I never knew you. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And again, we repeat for emphasis from Matthew, enter ye in at the straight gate. That's an S-T-R-A-I-T, gate. Not the shortest distance between two points. A straight means hard, difficult, exacting. That kind of a gate. And that's the kind of a gate that marriage is. And an eternal marriage is also straight and difficult. But it's rewarding and beautiful. Straight's the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be to find it. Now all Latter-day Saints are not going to be exalted. All people who have been through the Holy Temple are not going to be exalted. The Lord says, few there be that find it. For there are the two elements, the sealing of a temple, a sealing of a marriage in the Holy Temple, number one, and the living righteously through the one's life to follow that, to make it uh, uh, permanent. Only through proper marriage, and I repeat that, only through proper marriage can one find that straight way, the narrow path. No one can ever have life, real life, in any other way, under any other program. Sexual life outside of marriage, whether it be heterosexual or homosexual, is as a dream of the night that fades when the sun comes up. It is the, as the froth that accumulates on pounding waters. There seems to be a growing trend against marriage in the movie colonies, in the social groups, toward having sex without family, sex without marriage even. Naturally, the next question is why marry? 
It's only a slip of paper, they say. And the anti-marriage revolution comes into focus. Arguments are given that children are a burden, a tie, a responsibility. So be it. Men and women cohabit. They sin. They're guilty of deep transgression and seemingly without conscience. They've convinced themselves that education, freedom from restraint and responsibility, that's the life. And unfortunately, this benighted and destructive idea is taking hold of even some of our own people. The great thinkers of all speak and write about the family as being the welding link, the foundation of civilization. That being true, then all other vagaries and theories are but chaff that bloweth away and has no substance. Remember, for this is a day of warning, the scripture says, and not a day of many words. For I, the Lord, am not to be mocked in the last days. Can you think of any better mockery than a civil marriage, than no marriage at all? Behold, I am Alpha and Omega, even Jesus Christ. Now marriage should be solemnized in a holy temple. Paul told the Corinthians, the wife is bound to the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. Only in the Lord. Only in the Lord. Significant is the brilliant answer of the Savior to the Sadducees who tried to trap him. Master, they said, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he'd married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. They felt they had one question that he never could answer, that his face would turn red, that he would be embarrassed. Whose wife shall she be of the seven? Well, the answer was very simple, wasn't it? Neither of them would have her in eternity. She wouldn't be in exaltation because they were none of them married for eternity. They were all married till death do you part. The most deceptive little phrase that is in our language. The answer of Jesus was perfect. And that's the basis for my sermon tonight. They could have no further argument. Here was his answer. Do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the scriptures, neither the power of God? But when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels in heaven. But as teaching the resurrection, touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which is spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of the Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Let's examine that a moment. The Lord says again through Mark, Ye therefore do greatly err. At first it was a question. Don't you err not knowing the scriptures? And then he said, You do err not knowing the scriptures. God's plan is for them who live. God's plan is for them who live, not for them who are die. For them who receive the light, not for those who walk in darkness. For them who are prepared for eternal life, and not them who are satisfied with casual and sinful living. These people did not know the God of the burning bush. They did not know the God of Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. Yet they had the scriptures before them. They were travelers in a wilderness which had no defined plans. They knew not our God nor his power. No one who voluntarily rejects marriage here in mortality has any assurance of eternal life. 
Now there's a great difference between one who doesn't hear it, doesn't know it, and one who rejects it, because that is inherent in the word that they couldn't reject it if they didn't know it. The day cometh soon when no one will need to die without a temple marriage. There are already 13 or 14 temples, new ones being built. The day will come when there will be hundreds of temples all over this world, when there will not be a soul in the world probably that is more than a thousand miles away. And for a one-time experience in all one's life, a thousand miles is not far to go. It wouldn't be far to crawl if one knew what he was getting and what he was missing if he didn't go. Remember the temples of God are not for the temple ordinances, for those who have known the gospel. I'm sure we misunderstand that. Those who live like you have lived for 20 years, like some of you will live for 40 years and 80 years, uh, this temple work isn't for you. You do your work yourselves. That's your job to go up to this temple and get your endowments when you're properly matured. Your job, not your parents' jobs, nor the people after them, to give you blessings or to even open the door to blessings for you if you are not interested enough in it to get them for yourself. It's your grandfather and your great-great-grandparents and my great-great-grandparents. Those are the ones we go to the temple for. Those are the ones we do the work for. Those who were born when there was no gospel on the earth, when there was no temple nor idea of a temple. God is not the God of the living. I mean, he is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. And people who close their eyes and their ears and fail to follow the commandments of God are dead. They're dead as to all the things that are worthy, dead as to the benefits, dead as to the blessings, dead as to this natural and eternal gift. Temple ceilings are for your ancestors, the people who could have traveled all over the world and never found a temple, nor a temple president, nor helpers to take them through and give them their endowments, people who were good good as you and I are good or better, and who could have been well nigh perfect. But there were no temples, there were no temple workers. They had to wait. We must do their work for them. That's why we have our genealogical work. That's why we have the temples. Sure, we go forward and we do uh, have the work done for those who die, but we have no assurance whatever that they will ever accept it. For people are very much the same when they arise from the resurrection the day they were buried. It's for them to accept it, and it's for you to accept it. Today, while you live, while you can, while you have your own free agency. We have no guarantee that anyone will ever receive the gospel when we do it for them in, after their death. We hope they will, we go forward, and we hope that they will accept the gospel. There's a tremendous difference between, between him who misses the blessing and him who rejects the blessing. Men of our day calculate and evaluate and develop opinions and kick against the pricks and close the door to their own opportunities. You won't do that, will you? These people were like the Pharisees, these Sadducees. They were like the Pharisees and the hypocrites and the scribes who set up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. But could there be any excuse for any of us? Few of us have joined the church recently. Most of us have been in the church all our lives. Most of us have seen the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price up on the mantle all of our 20 years. And we haven't sought to find out exactly what it means, how deeply it goes. Everything that is in the world, whether it be ordained of men, shall be thrown, see, whether it be ordained of men, 
that are not by me and by my word, saith the Lord, shall be thrown down and shall not remain after men are dead. Men may perform the marriages, certainly. We will continue to do so. We have our hope is everlasting, and we will continue to do the work for those who didn't do it. But we have no assurance, as I've said. Mortal death terminates a mortal marriage. Now, don't kid yourself, using that slang phrase. Don't try to opinionate this thing. Don't try to argue yourself out of this. You're either married by the word of the Lord, by his servants, or you're not married after you're dead. And death comes, regardless of how we would push it off if we could. A few months ago, a call came from a sister whose husband had been dead for some years, whose son and his wife had recently been killed in an, automobile, or in an airplane accident, leaving several small children. Alone in deep anguish, this sweet woman with many regrets, she told me that these young victims of the airplane crash had not been married in the temple. They were middle-aged, both coming from good families. They'd either ignored it or postponed it. They'd lived the majority of their lifetime on the earth and still had not been had this ordinance performed. At death, our sympathies, of course, go, are greatly stirred. And oftentimes at funerals, speakers in their kindness make many promises to the living mourners for the dead that could not be substantiated by the scriptures. I've heard them many times promise that this good man will go direct to eternal life, and yet he's not been married in the temple. And his life didn't warrant it anyway. They had the gospel, they had the opportunities, they ignored their privileges. They will unfortunately drink the dregs of a bitter cup. And so will you, if you fail this important thing. I remember an article in a local newspaper where a young couple was married in Salt Lake by a man who had only civil authority no power beyond the grave. They had a brilliant wedding breakfast. They got in the car to travel to another city for an evening wedding reception where hundreds of friends and relatives would come to wish them well. They did not reach their destination. There was no reception. A car accident took their lives. Their mortality was ended and eternal life had not been provided for about six hours of marriage, and the end of it came like a flash of lightning. And the sad thing was that their almost momentary marriage was performed within a mile of the Salt Lake Temple, where were a holy man with the sealing power who would gladly have saved them from the bitter cup. They're in eternity now. I don't know what they think and what they're doing, but they're not prepared for eternity. They had grown to 20 years or more of life, and they didn't go to the temple even though they were members of the church. They ignored it. They laughed at it. If they ever gave a serious thought, do you suppose they were saying, oh, we can have the sealing ordinance performed later? Do you suppose the bereaved family were thinking, well, it's too bad? But then we can go to the temple in a year and have the work done for them. Yes, the family can go to the temple a year later. Yes, they can do the ordinance work for them. And the records will show it. But the question is, will the young deceased couple accept the ordinances when they were of such little consequence to them while they lived? And more important than all else, do you think that God is going to be mocked? He is the God of the living, not of the dead, and they were dead, both physically and at least it would seem spiritually. He has identified this ordinance as one to be done in mortality while you have your body and your spirit together. Perhaps not any scripture emanating from the mouth of God 
has been so definite and positive and unchangeable as those we are quoting. It's been said that we rise from the grave much as we lie down in it. We change little in our attitudes and moods and desires in that period when our spirit is freed from our body that's in the grave. The process of change in the body does not necessarily change the inner man. If the gospel truths meant little to us as we die, they're not likely to mean very much to us when we rise. Most of you will know of specific cases where a bereft loved one rushes to the temple at the end of the year to do sealings. I always think of the Ten Virgins parable where the five wise virgins took their lamps filled with oil to meet the bridegroom, and then the five foolish virgins who slumbered and slept came at midnight when the bridegroom was announced. They begged oil of their neighbors, but without success. And with their unlighted vessels, they came fumbling and shuffling along, saying, Lord, Lord, and or to, or open to us. But the bridegroom said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Now that isn't being a mean, that isn't being unkind, it's just following a program. They knew it. They had their lambs. They knew they needed oil in their lambs. They didn't provide it. Time is passing. Time is fleeting. We have no guarantee for continued living. Procrastination is a veritable thief. We mortals have had 20 or 40 or 80 years to come to a knowledge of the truth and to abide by the requirements. For us who neglect or procrastinate or deny or reject, the doors are closing. As with the ten virgins, the day is passing. Darkness approaches. Now think about it. There are those who reject the priesthood today. Thousands of them, I guess 10,000 men, will not receive the priesthood. They're offered it. They will not accept. Will it always, even in eternity, be handed out to them, forced upon them? Can he change his mind and grasp it as time goes on? These are solemn questions. Those who have accepted and failed to live up to its requirements, will they have it or lose it in time and eternity? I tell you, folks, God will not be mocked. He's given us a program. He's given us a chance for mature consideration. He's not playing games with us. It's the most vital of all decisions. First, we must develop that worthiness which makes one eligible for the blessings. Second, to grasp the opportunity which makes the, the opportunity of the ordinance. And third, to remain faithful and worthy to that marriage and to all righteousness. And then the promised blessings may not be withheld by anyone. Again, the Lord reiterates the message in the 18th verse. If a man marry a wife and make a covenant with her, if not by me, the Lord, by proper authority, it is not valid. I tell you again, no statements have ever been made with greater force or power. There is no question for opinion, no place for opinion or for argument. If it isn't done by me, saith the Lord, or by my servants and my program, it is not valid, neither in force when they're out of the world, when they're dead, because they are not joined by me, nor by my word. Such a time marriage is in the world and cannot be received other uh, than in the world. The Lord speaks of the angels and says that their rewards do not compare with men and women who are worthy, quote, who are worthy of a far more and an exceeding and an eternal weight of glory. We've always grown up thinking of the angels as being the last word in righteousness, haven't we? The angels are greatly inferior to every person in this room who will live all these commandments the Lord requires 
at the hands of these persons. When the Lord speaks of the angels and the gods who are appointed at the gate, it reminds us of immigration laws as we go into the various countries of the world. Like the immigration officers, the angels will receive the visas, the passports. They will check the prerequisites. They will see if the documents are all in order. They have an appointment as gatekeepers. The Lord again is emphatic, saying, Those who have not earned the reward of eternal life shall not pass. Shall not pass. They cannot, therefore, inherit my glories. Now on the positive side, these are blessings which will be available to those who meet the requirements. The blessings are promised to those of kingdoms, principalities, and powers, dominions, all heights and depths. As I come into the United States immigration offices frequently, each gatekeeper has a large book, and he quickly looks at my name on the passport and then opens this huge book and looks under K to see if I am on the blacklist, to see if there's anything wrong, if I have been unworthy of entrance into this kingdom, this republic. And so shall it be when men go to their permanent homes the angels and gods will be at the gate. They will know your records. They will have the records of these who are faithful in having the ordinance and living worthy of it. The promise is made, and they shall pass by the angels and the gods, which are set there, to their exaltation. We're further promised of a glory, quote, which glory shall be a fullness and a continuation of their seed forever and ever. Then shall they, we, they be gods, because they have no end. Therefore shall they be from everlasting to everlasting, because they continue. Then shall they be above all, above all, because all things are subject unto them. Now this, again, I say is not a matter of opinion. This isn't something you can go out and argue about. The judges at the gate will know by it for sure. The formula, the records, the spirit, the true deserts, the book of life will show the earthly activities of the earthly servants. And the book of the angels will give the entire story of every man of that which he did in the light and in the shadows, in the open and in the corners, all that is said in the secret places and from the housetops, all that was thought and expressed, whether good or bad, there will be no escape. The honest judge will give full value to all for their good works and will not overlook the other. I've repeated the conditions and the restrictions and the glories and the benefits because we're all inclined to let them pass by. And, but the Lord has repeated over and over as his message of the revelation came to Joseph over and over. And as we read the scriptures over and over and again in the 21st verse, verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye abide my law, ye cannot attain this glory. There are no musts or ifs or questions in there. There's no room for argument or quibbling. This is forthright and sure. Now let me say here, lest someone misunderstand, we're not talking about plural marriage as you might, as someone might think. We're talking about the eternal law of marriage or temple marriage as referred to in the 131st section, wherein he, the Lord, says in eight words that are in brackets, meaning the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. This is the covenant wherein a man and a woman are conditionally sealed for eternity. That's the new and everlasting covenant of marriage which came to us in our day for us. The Lord said in 1843 again, straight is the gate 
and narrow the way that leadeth unto the exaltation and the continuation of the lives, pure, plural, of the lives, our great posterity in the eternities that follow. Few there be that find it, because ye receive me not in the world, neither do ye know me. But if ye receive me in the world, then shall ye know me and shall receive your exaltation, subject, of course, to your continued worthiness. If ye receive me in this world, if you go to the temple worthily, receive your endowments, your sealing program, then the Lord guarantees us, providing, of course, our continued worthiness, he guarantees us an exaltation, continuation of lives, creatorship, and all of the great blessings that any righteous man might want. Broad is the way, the gate, and wide the way that leadeth to the depths, and many there are that go in there at, because they receive me not, neither do they abide in my law. In our own dispensation, God has said, those few will know him and will receive their exaltation and be with him. The mysteries are promised. And the Lord on one occasion said, and the mysteries of the kingdom ye shall keep within yourselves. For it is not meet to give that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet. For the world cannot receive that which ye yourselves are not able to bear. Wherefore, ye shall not give the pearls unto the swine. The Lord said in another place in the to the multitudes, give, that which is give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Now this is a good question the Lord asked. He asks it of every one of you. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? He made it very clear. He that heareth and doeth not is like a man without a foundation, built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the rain and the ruin of that house was great. Now, young folks, in, uh, as I near the conclusion, may I plead with you that you never consider for one moment forsaking of this great principle. Yesterday, a young woman said to her fiancé, if you cannot get a temple recommend, then I'm not about to spend my life with you. Now there's a lot of strength in that. If his bishop and his stake president will not sign a recommend for him, there's something wrong. Something that's going to show up after they're married, after they have a family. Something that's going to continue. So, and then a certain young missionary said to his girlfriend, I'm sorry, as much as I love you, I will not marry out of the temple. On the brighter side, may I bring to your attention that some months ago, I divided a stake, making two excellent ones in its place. In the process of searching for a new president for a stake, we go with the process of elimination, and we get record, we get there, have an interview with each one. And uh, I find out all I can about these men because any one of them might possibly qualify to be the state president. Of the men we interviewed, we found that 29 men had 121 children. The average was four and three tenths children per family or six and three tenths persons per family. Not a single divorce among them. This was only 29 out of a community. There may have been hundreds more. But of these 29 men that I interviewed, not a single divorce among them. No broken homes in these 29 families. Every child of the 121 had two parents, a father and a mother, which is very unusual these days. To have two parents, a mother and a father, no divorce had broken these homes. All of the men were fairly well employed and fairly well off. Forty-three of the children were teenagers, but there were no serious problems. They were 
probably uh, had some questions, as many young people do, but there were no serious problems. Every one of these 29 men was married in the Holy Temple. Every one of these 121 children was born under the covenant. None of you have any right, any right whatever, to rob your children of that privilege. Not any one of you has that right. When you marry, you should marry for your family, not for your selfish desires and passions. Every one of the 29 men was married in the temple, and every one was faithful in carrying forward the work of the Lord. I wondered why the Lord used Abraham especially for his pattern and example. And then I read, quote, Abraham received all things whatsoever he received by revelation and commandment face to face with his eternal God. Every person in this room can have that same experience if he will do the works of Abraham. And the Lord said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham was tested and was true and faithful, the father of nations. And the Lord said again, Abraham hath entered into his exaltation and now sitteth upon his throne. Abraham followed the path I'm telling you you should follow. And you can follow the same one and find your exaltation and find your throne and sit upon it. And so the great commandments and promises can be had by all of us. And so we wonder why, why, oh why, with all these blessings and promises that men will fail to marry and fail to marry right and thus waste their lives in a frozen wilderness. Why will any person ever give a single thought to a marriage out of the temple and jeopardize those glories that are available? Why would a person with a temple marriage ever think of divorce or breaking up the family or of any other immoralities or infidelities? Why, oh why? Some years ago I spoke on this campus about a certain king who abdicated his throne for what he thought was love for a woman who, with him, thus robbed him of his kingdom, honor, and riches. And while there are few kings today who abdicate their thrones, there are numerous, 60 percent, wasn't it, of you young men who are princes who abdicate your thrones before you come to it. 60 percent of you? Oh, that wouldn't be true of this congregation. But it's true in this church, and it's certainly lamentable. Let me close with a little story that I told after returning from Europe in 1955. I'd been to the temple dedication. One German woman whom I knew had lost her husband in the war. When I was in the temple at its dedication in Bern, this sweet German woman told me her story. Her husband had disappeared 10 years before. That was in 1945, the war ended. No word was ever had from him or as to his whereabouts. It was presumed that he was dead. After the dedication, having talked to President McKay about it and having the permission, and after these people, this sweet woman had been through the temple for her endowments, I saw her again as she went to the temple to, or to the counter to get her clothing. I saw her in the session with contentment and peace upon her face. I saw her after the temple service, and she said to me with a great satisfaction, Brother Kimball, I have now been sealed to my husband. Let the war come. Let the persecutions pile up. Let the bombs burst. Let whatever needs be come that war brings on. I'm all right now. I am sealed to my husband, and I am at peace, and life is good. As we close, we seem to hear a gracious, loving God reminding us, I gave you your opportunity. I taught you the right principles. You knew better. When you refuse to hearken, you will suffer the consequences. He is saying, 
A man must enter into this new and everlasting covenant, or he cannot be exalted. You did not listen. If you abide not that covenant, then you're damned. All those who have this law revealed to them must obey the same. All marriage contracts, not by me, are of no efficacy in life to come. Fail in this law and you can never be God's. Obey not my law, ye cannot attain my glory. Receive ye therefore my law, the Lord said. Now, my young brothers and sisters, if I meet any of you beyond the veil, I'll reach there before you do. If you come, don't any one of you ever come to Brother Kimball and say, you didn't tell me. I didn't understand. Nobody warned me of this. I came to my marriage without knowledge. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. This is a vital message. I hope that it is sunk into your hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.